podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Smart People Podcast. I'm Chris Stemp. And I'm John Rojas. We're glad you could join us today. Please indulge in the music we have in the background. Again, don't call that out. I'm calling it out, but it's there to stimulate the mind. It's to stimulate your thought process because that's what we're talking about today. You might say, hey, guys, you talk about the brain too much. You interview too many psychologists, psychiatrists. But I disagree. Today we're covering a wide variety of things. We're talking about emotion. We're talking about morals, morality, nature versus nurture. Culture, society. It's a good one. God, this is intense. It does. It gets, you, the, it gets the heart racing. Can, can you cut it? I can't even concentrate with all yeah, this. Yeah, you got it. So anyways, thanks for joining us today, guys. We're really excited for what, you know, what we're going to bring you. Um, before we get into that, a couple things we want to plug real quick. Um, first, our Amazon.com purchases are really down. It's like, it's pathetic. We can't even pay for the new studio. Uh, you know what, though? It's July. I mean, who buys July 4th presents? So we got some holidays coming up, you know. What's, what, Labor what's, Day? What's, yeah, Labor Day. Can hey, you buy, buy white shoes? Buy that or, flag. Yeah. Guys, we, if you're buying anything, seriously, like toothpaste, they sell great toothpaste. Go to our website, smartpeoplepodcast.com, and check out the Amazon link. Click on that. Brings you to Amazon, and it's a easy way to support us. We know you guys do. We're kind of just messing with you, but it's been a tough month, so me and John are eating ramen. The next thing I wanted to talk about was the newsletter that is a recent addition to the Smart People Podcast. It's in the upper right-hand corner of our website. There's... 13 exclamation marks, I believe. How many did you put there? Uh, I stopped counting. Okay. You can just type in your email address and the newsletter is going to be used for a more engaging communication in the future. I'll let you know when we're interviewing people. I'll let you know who's on the list. I'll link to some of the articles, books, things prior to interviewing them. So it's just a way to kind of be more involved in what's going on with the show. So if you want to be part of that, put your email in there and we're good to go. Also, head over to iTunes. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. After subscribing, go ahead, rate it, leave a comment. I recently heard, I don't know if it's true or not, but the iTunes algorithm is weighted the most on ratings. So the more four, five, just no, five, just five just star. Who am I kidding? The more five star ratings we can get, we greatly appreciate. Throw a comment in there too. That helps. I mean, like we said in in the past, you can list different guests you want us to interview. You can say, hey, you guys sound awesome or hey, you need to fix this. You need to fix that. Whatever you want to put in there. You can even say hi. Say, hey, Chris. Hey, John. What's going on? Just wanted to let you guys know that I left you five stars. We'll be really happy. You know, I look at those from time to time and a lot of times I see the comments on there and it just brightens my day. So it would be awesome if I could do that every day. That is true. So thanks for being part of the show. And we do this to kind of uh, bring everybody some knowledge and some thoughts, some emotions that they might not have had. And this week, who better to talk about these subjects with than Jesse Prince? He is, I mean, he's the man. Uh, let's go through some things that he's done before. He is currently a distinguished professor of philosophy at the City University of New York Graduate Center. He's at that same place. He's also the director of the Committee for Interdisciplinary Science Studies. He's taught at Chapel Hill, Washington University, St. Louis. He writes for um, Psychology Today often. He has numerous books such as Beyond Human Nature, Gut Reactions, A Perceptual Theory of Emotion. He's got all kinds of stuff. He got his PhD from the University of Chicago. Don't know if you've ever heard of it. Kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. You were telling me what? They were the number one rated B school or something? They were, la I believe, last year, but I know they've got a fantastic program there. Jesse's an awesome guy. And the thing I love about him, that what, what got me hooked is he studies the philosophy of psychology. 
Now, I don't know if you guys are aware of that. I feel like we've talked to a lot of psychologists. I've read a lot of books. For some reason, I'm just being introduced to this field, the philosophy of psychology, but it's incredible. And we're not, we're not trying to glorify the atrocity of the shooting in, in Colorado, but we talked to Jesse a little bit about what might have been going on in, in the mind of the shooter and things like that and, and what must go through the brain of somebody who can do things like that. So going through you know, the way people act and the way you funnel emotions, it's something that it affects our everyday lives. And I think it's important to kind of talk to people that might know and understand what's going on. Speaking of that terrible event that happened in Colorado last week, I urge you guys to head over to calebmedley.com. It's C-A-L-E-B-M-E-D-L-E-Y.com. Caleb's got a donation page set up. He's one of the victims of the shooting. Uh, He's kind of in a, I guess, special circumstance in the fact that he doesn't have health insurance. So they're estimating his health care to be up in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. He's a local comic in Colorado, doesn't make a lot of money. Him and his wife actually just gave birth to a baby not even, I think, a month ago. So they're kind of in a tight spot. I know they've got a donation page up on that on calebmedley.com. A lot of people have been giving. I've linked to it on Facebook and Twitter and that kind of stuff. But it would just be awesome if you guys have you know an extra five, ten bucks laying around. Just send it Caleb's way kind of think about him and his family and all the other victims that were there in Colorado. Yeah, and our hearts go out to him. We didn't mean for the show to kind of take on that form, but it's just something that's on everybody's mind. So again, make sure you head over there and think about Caleb and his family. So we're going to turn it over to Jesse Prince, and I'm really excited to let you guys hear about the interview. It is fantastic. We cover a wide range of topics regarding your brain, why you do what you do, and why you feel what you feel, what makes us human. Here is Jesse Prince talking about you and your crazy brain. I first want to start off and say, as we just discussed prior to the show, you deal with the philosophy of psychology, which is something I find incredible, and I can't believe I hadn't heard that much about it up until now. Would you consider yourself more of a philosopher or a psychologist? Well, I think even the question reflects uh, something about where we are now in our very specialized world. There was a time when psychology didn't exist as a separate discipline, and the people who thought about the mind were really philosophers by, by training. And it's only about uh, maybe 150 years that we've had the term psychology and a group of people who are paid to think about how minds work uh, as as an exclusive vocation. But I really think that we'd be better off getting rid of all these disciplinary boundaries and basically defining our professional lives by which questions we're interested in. And for me, the mind is, is about as fascinating a topic as you can find. And if philosophers have something to say about the mind, I want to hear it. If psychologists or neuroscientists or anthropologists do, that's equally interesting to me. So in a way, my profession is studying the mind from every possible angle. Okay. I like that. And I I see where you're coming from because it strikes me as odd. You were saying, you know, psychology hasn't been around or or I guess psychology has probably been around for a while, but it's known as that, you know, the study of the brain and emotions and all that hasn't been around for that long And to me, it seems like, how is that possible? It's one of the most fascinating things. I mean, technically, isn't our mind, our brain, the way it controls us, one of the most central things to human existence? Well, absolutely. I mean, it is, in a way, it is human existence. Exactly. We we are our brains, and I think that uh, the world that we experience, the world we reside in, is always the world that we've kind of built by having the kinds of minds that we do. There's an an old... uh, concept from the from the study of animal behavior um, coined by a, a German animal scientist named Van Uxkel called the Umwelt, which is basically the environment. And the idea is what a snail sees and what a crab sees and a fish sees and an insect or a dog, those are all different than what a human sees or a monkey sees. And I think that each of us resides in the world that's constructed by having a certain kind of sensory system and, of course, a certain kind of intellect. And the human world is really one of the most interesting and, and uh, perhaps the most rich world that we can find among all the world's experience in the animal kingdom. 
Do you think at all, and I agree with you, I don't think anybody would disagree, but do you think at all that's just because we want to feel at the center of the universe? We're like, we are the best. Everything about us and our existence is more important than, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but better than other living things' existence? Is that kind of a, a too centric way of looking at it? Oh, you know, I think all animals are the, the center of the universe. You know, frogs don't care much about uh, anything but frogs, and, and there's very little of the world that they actually are able to right. experience. Right. Uh, so from a frog's eye, uh, the world pretty much revolves around frog life. So I think all creatures see the world from the perspective of their own species' needs. Uh, but human beings have this special capacity to also shape, shape, re change, reform, or change the world. So we're, in a way, uh, not just perceiving the world in a very species-centric way. We're also creating a world. And the fact that we live in houses and wear clothing and alter the environment makes us absolutely unique. And that desire to control and that capacity to control is also unprecedented in the animal kingdom. That's awesome. And that... That right there is when I know I'm like, okay, this guy knows what's going on because that is an answer that I can go with and understand and feel like that makes sense. I wanted to kind of dive in a little bit to, I know you deal with a lot of different things, but in your writings and your research, you talk a lot about nature versus nurture. And I've always been one to think, and I want you to tell me I'm, I'm wrong or at least show me the other side. We're completely controlled by biology. We're completely controlled by chemicals. I mean, when I break it down, I'm like, well, happiness is just some dopamine or serotonin chemical released by our body. And it, we really don't have anything else. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you tend to stray away a little bit and say the way, you know, the way you experience the environment is also going to impact who you are. Could you kind of dive into that for me? Absolutely. I mean, I think that the really fascinating thing about human beings is that we are capable of learning. I mean, that's really what sets us apart. All of our incredible accomplishments come through incremental learning. If you think about the, the structures we build, the sciences we, we have, they all come from step-by-step -step improvements in what we know and how we understand. And I think if we were driven by our biology, we'd be where the animals are. We'd be stuck with some fixed program that totally delimits what we're capable of doing. But instead, we have a biology that says we can go bio beyond biology. We have a biology that says this is our starting place, but we can acquire knowledge, share and disseminate information that allows us to go beyond the biological givens and create this thing called culture. You know, I mentioned clothing before, and I think just to pause and meditate on the miracle of clothing, like it's just totally spectacular that all of us right now are sitting wearing some kind of outfit. And, you know, other creatures don't do that. They walk around naked. And it's not just that they're hairier than we are. It's that they couldn't do it. They couldn't come up with this idea of, oh, let's conquer the elements. Let's protect our bodies. And the fact that human beings can do it and do that differently in every corner of the world and do it in a way that's self-expressive and do it in a way that's constantly changing is, I think, I mean, we, it's, we think fashion is superficial, but it's actually a deep insight into just how spectacular we are and I think that feature that makes us most spectacular is our capacity for, for change, for reinvention, for growth, for learning, and for creativity. I saw something that you said, you know, experience can change the mind. And is that, are you talking about the way somebody grows up or what's the word? Not, I don't want to use a derogatory term, but people that are kind of a little crazy. Is that often, do you think it's primarily because of how they were raised or something in their history or is it something you're born with? Because from what I know about it, you know, a light can just turn off in your mind and you can all of a sudden be a different person. And that seems like it would be driven not by the environment, but primarily by your biological makeup. Well, I, I do think we need to get beyond the dichotomy between biology and learning. Obviously, we're biocultural creatures. Having the minds we do biologically is very important for having the outcomes we do. So, you know, because we have minds that are more sophisticated than a dog, if you take a dog to college, it's not going to learn. If you take a human to college, it's going to learn. So that's something about a biology. But the learning itself, that's coming from the environment. So 
What's special about us is the, this capacity for growth. And I think when it comes to mental illness, you'll find a similar biocultural story. You'll find a story that depends on our biology, but depends on the environment as well. So look at something like depression. So a lot of people suffer from depression, but there are huge cultural differences in how much depression there is and how depression manifests itself and who gets depressed. So we're actually seeing depression on the rise. We're seeing a 10% increase each generation in depression. And we're also seeing that women tend to be much more depressed than men are. And one story would just be to say, there's something, I don't know, there's something in the diet that's making right. us more, and more depressed, or that women are just biologically more prone towards depression than men. But I think a biocultural story looks at it differently. It says every human being is born with the capacity to become depressed. Maybe some have a greater capacity than others, but environmental variables are going to start to have an impact on whether that capacity gets realized. So living in a world of constant uh, stress and exposure to high-speed media that make us feel inadequate by constantly being confronted with images of people who are better than us, more successful than us, with all this pressure to succeed, that can be a real downer. And if you see an increase in depression, it might have to do with the fact that the media age has put people into a kind of face-to-face -face confrontation with their own inadequacy 24-7, where every time that TV goes on. Or if you think about women, you know, the rise in female depression, women's lives are tough, and we've lived through a radical change in possibility for women in, in our uh, recent history. And a consequence of that is there's all this pressure for women to be caregivers, to, to run a household, but also to succeed in a career. So suddenly women are saddled with these double expectations that they're going to both maintain a household and bring home the bacon. And it's not surprising that that joint source of pressure is having a differential impact on half the population. So I think what we gain from a biocultural perspective is a kind of science of difference. We say, look, not everybody is ending up depressive. Not everybody is ending up ill. And what's the difference between those people who have the bad outcomes and those people who have the good outcomes? Something about their biology may matter, but if you leave the environment out of the equation, you may be missing out on a huge factor in explaining these differences in outcome. Look at cross-cultural differences in happiness. It's true that some people are more prone to be joyous than others. Some people are, you know, temperamentally uh, cheerful. But cross-culturally, you see huge national differences. And even countries that have suffered from tremendous turmoil within, countries like Colombia, which has been racked by civil war for decades, score higher on happiness measures than countries like the United States. And you say, what's going on there? Are they just like biologically different from us? And we know the answer to that, and the answer is no. And what really seems to be going on is that there are cultural factors that lead people in different uh, national settings to feel greater contentment with their lives than in other national settings. Poverty, war, violence, those things can make people misery. But there are also just approaches to living that can make a huge difference in whether you face each day with a smile or with a frown. I wanted to ask the question right before you got to answering it, based around the fact that do you think that you know teens and, and adolescents now are becoming more and more depressed because of social media and all that kind of stuff? And you know, you basically said, yes, do you deal with any research around that? I mean, what what are the kind of studies and stuff that you've seen that show that direct, I guess, correlation with the increased social media and comparing yourself and, and those type of things? Well, I, I think we need to really recognize that media can change the mind. And we're, we're, it's early days, and a lot of the relevant research isn't done. But take a domain like video games, where people really have started to look at the effects. And it's a double-edged sword. So you can see, for example, that playing video games, including, and in fact, especially including violent first-person shooter games, actually has all these positive results. It makes people better at multitasking. <laughs> Jesse, Perfect. wait, wait. I'm sorry. I have to cut you off. Okay. Please don't forget where you are. But I have been playing a first-person shooter game every day for like a month. And it makes me feel better. Don't think I'm crazy, but the reason is because I get to lose myself for a little bit. Time does not exist. And I can just focus on the task at hand, whatever it might be. And I totally agree with you. So I yeah. just had to throw that in. 
you still, but you still have me on the pros, and I'm going to get to the cons. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we knew that was coming. Good side is really good. I mean, the good news is like every cognitive measure, how well you attend, how well you retain information, all that stuff is improving as a result of these games that require hypervigilance and hand-eye coordination. But the downside is that the sheer violence of these games is also, to a certain extent, anesthetizing people to, to shooting. So it's, I, I certainly think we need to be cautious about jumping to conclusions like video games made somebody commit some egregious crime. It's not that simple. But I do think there's pretty good evidence now that exposure to media violence does increase the probability of violence. So we're in this delicate game. We have a balance, a kind of dance that we need to, to figure out how to do, which involves taking the good that's coming from all these new media, but also protecting ourselves against the potential harm. And um, I think that the dangerous position is the one that says, this stuff has no impact. It does. And I think what we need to do is, is really use the sciences at our disposal to figure out exactly what that impact is and how to control it. I think we would be doing a disservice if we had someone like you on the show with something in the news so prevalent as the, the shooting at the movie theater in Colorado and not talk to you about that, especially because you deal with morality and emotion, something that I think played such a huge role in, in, in the violence out there. I wanted to ask you, I mean, you're the perfect person. Do you think or what do you think behind somebody who can do that? Do they were they born that way or is it a combination? You know, there's I have so many questions for you, but I guess the first one I wanted to know is were they not loved as a child or is it just you're born without the right DNA structure? Well, I first thing to say is that I I think we don't know enough yet about James Holmes, but I do think the ways in which he seems to have had a break with reality suggest a kind of psychotic disorder. So he might be schizophrenic. Wow. And one really fascinating thing about schizophrenia is that in identical twins, we're talking about people who are genetically identical, the chance of one twin having schizophrenia if the other does is still a, basically a coin toss. So wow. in it, it's much, much more likely that you're going to be schizophrenic if your twin is, but it's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And that tells us that it's not simply part of the biology. It's not simply that you have this destiny that you're going to end up having florid, paranoid hallucinations if you have a certain genome. You can have the same genome and end up that way or not. So what's going on there? And one of the things that I think frustrates medical science is we really don't yet know what the environmental factors are that serve as the, as the difference maker. What's the trigger that makes somebody who has this disposition end up on the psychotic side as opposed to the healthy side? One thing we tend to find when we look at the environmental contributors to, to mental illness is they, they often involve very isolated events. Uh, a specific trauma in a person's life, a specific aspect of their biographical experience might be making a difference rather than some broader factor that's shared between you know, them and everybody who happens to be in their, in their cohort. So I don't think we know what went on with, uh, with the Holmes case, but I do think we you know, know enough about the science to believe that it's not just the genes that, that made him do it. And of course, there are there are lots of people who might suffer from the same clinical syndrome, say it's schizophrenia, who are not going on killing sprees. Right. And actually, we had this debate, John and I had this debate last night, and I didn't mean to focus on this topic, but it's hard to avoid it. With somebody like this, do you think, given all the research you've done, I mean, obviously, you know a ton about this. Is it possible he was so removed from himself or reality he didn't know what was going on? Because for a... And I hesitate to say normal, but somebody who understands how terrible something like that is, I, I just find it hard to believe you cannot know what you are doing or what just happened. You know, I, I think I, we don't know enough about him yet. There okay. is this talk that he thought he was inside some kind of simulation. But I do think that there's a way in which all of us are living in a kind of delusion. In fact, many delusions. So, you know, all of us, for instance, have the courage of our convictions. So take morality. We all really believe that we're right. Now, everyone, like, you know, take politics. Everyone thinks that they're voting for the right guy. <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, that, that's deeply felt. And when you see somebody who votes for the, 
for the opposition, you say, they must be an idiot, or worse still, maybe they're evil. They must, you know, they must really know that you're right, but they're still voting for this bad guy. What's wrong with them? And I think that once you get in a mindset that says this is the one and only truth, you end up with a kind of distorted view of reality. So, I and mean, we're even seeing that now with the debate over this particular tragedy. So, for instance, the 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 uh, left have gotten very excited about gun control. This is an opportunity for them to support gun control. And I actually think there are lots of good reasons why why there should be more regulation on guns. So I'm not trying to take a side on this issue, but. This particular case seems irrelevant. This guy had enough homemade bombs in his apartment to blow out the walls of his building. Right. Suppose he brought one of those homemade bombs to the movie theater and used that instead of a submachine gun. You know, this guy would have killed a lot wow. of people. Wow. Yeah, I didn't so, even think about that. There's nothing about access to guns that makes this person more of a threat. He's a, he's a deranged individual who has decided with a sense of deep conviction that he has to do this thing. And he's going to find whatever means are available to do it, whether it's legal or illegal, whether it involves use of firearms or, you know, maybe household cleaners that he's turned into some weapon of mass destruction. So I think when we're dealing with a, a person who uh, who is intent on causing harm, there's unfortunately not a whole lot we can do to protect ourselves. All we need to do is is try and work to have a society that has enough um you know, facilities for mental health and checks and balances to make sure that most of the time people who are really a threat are, are identified early and, and put into the uh, helpful services that they need to, to get out of harm's way. And, you know, I think this that, that usually does happen. This was really a, a rare and isolated event. Right. And, you know, I think this kind of plays into not this specifically, but talking about how cultures, you know, our media-driven culture or uh, societies, how they change the way people act. It plays right into the book that you have, you know, Beyond Human Nature, how culture and experience shape our lives. And you talk a lot about even through where you are geographically, that can substantially change the way people act and people respond to even similar stimulus. So, do you think that things such as violence can be easily determined by something as, as simple as gun control? Or is it also the way a society is as a whole? You know, we're not as religious or we're more religious or we're not as tied to our family as another culture. You know, how does that change the way we act as a, as a culture? I, I think it's all of those things. I mean, I think we really need to, um, it's, it's risky to be too uh, narrow in thinking about the variables that matter. So sometimes having strong family ties can lead to greater violence. Sometimes it can lead to less violence. Uh, if you take, you know, look at any, any particular variable, take something like alcoholism. And you might say, okay, what causes alcoholism? And you might say, oh, well, this is a genetic problem. There's a gene for alcoholism. And there is a massive effort to identify genes for alcoholism. And far more of the federal bu budget that's invested on this question has gone into the search for genes than in the search for environmental variables. But it turns out that actually living close to a liquor store is a bigger factor in determining whether you'll be an alcoholic. Wow. Known biological marker. Wow. And I, you know, and if you look at something like intelligence outcomes, we spend a lot of money trying to look for what are the biological correlates of intelligence. And I think that we do see individual differences there, but we also see just huge IQ discrepancies as a function of wealth. So it's kind of like, okay, we see some people having bad outcomes, some people having good outcomes. We can spend a lot of money trying to find a little bit of biological material that has some small impact on outcome. Or we can look for giant, glaring social factors that have a huge impact on outcome. Both matter, but I think you know when we're dealing with a limited budget for investment, we need to be focusing on the on the social factors. And I think when you look at something like like violence, um, there are factors that matter. You can see people, for example, take take somebody who's living in poverty but also feeling humiliated, feeling like they had a real chance at opportunity, but it's been taken away from them. That's the profile of a suicide terrorist. You know, if you look at the people who commit these egregious acts, they're not people who are particularly religious in the sense of being 
uh, maybe maybe uh, we, we would use terms like fanatical. They're often highly educated, highly sensible, but they're thinking to themselves, you know what? I've been held back. I have all this potential. I'm smart. I'm educated. I can do anything. But my range of opportunity has been, has been delimited by some factor outside of my control. That makes me outraged, and I want to go out and get revenge. That's the psychology we need to worry about. And I think if we, if we do too much to sort of stereotype the underlying uh, psychology and think about it as deranged or mentally ill and don't look at the broader social climate that creates this kind of rage, we'll, we'll end up doing less than we can do to try and prevent violence. John and I both just looked at each other and, okay, we need to digest that because it, it's kind of intense. The other thing is, in your book, Gut Reactions, I love it because talking about emotion, in my opinion, it brings all this together, right? Emotion is something we all know, but we can't quite put our finger on. We don't know what it is, where it comes from. And what you say is emotions are perceptions of changes in the body. I love it. I love the quote because as a human, you experience emotions that literally change your life, change the way you go about your daily business. And what you posit is that emotions are just the way you perceive things. They're not an actual, they, they can be different through people. So I was hoping you could kind of talk to us about the research you've done behind emotions and how you define them. I, I think it's helpful to start by imagining a world without emotions. Like imagine you just never felt any emotions at all and ask yourself, would you still have any interest in food? Would you still have any interest in sex? Would you find anything beautiful or attractive? Would you care what your home looked like, what you were wearing, what your you know, romantic partner looked like? Would you care about romance? Would you bother turning on the TV? And I think it's obvious on a moment's reflection that without emotion, we live in a world without value. We live in a world where nothing is attractive, appealing. And of course, the converse is also true. Nothing is enraging, repellent, disgusting. A world without emotion is a world where we're not motivated to care one way or the other about anything that we come into contact with. That literally made the hair stand up on my arms. That I've never looked at emotion like that. Would you say they're the driving force then behind everything? I think emotions are the driving force behind everything we care about. To care about something is to have an emotion about it. And I think that's why the body is so important for emotion. So imagine that you're standing in front of this object. Maybe it's a cold beer. Maybe it's a you know, beautiful hamburger or something like that. And you know, if you had no emotions, this is, this is an object of total indifference. It could be a blade of grass. You don't care at all. But if it's something you like, what happens is your body tells you you like it. Your body wants to approach it. You feel this almost force within you saying, I want to grab that thing. I want to take hold of it. I want to consume it. And I think that this notion that we use our bodies as information, that we feel our bodies repelled by things or compelled by things is so important to understanding why we care about anything at all. That's the foundation of what it is to have morality. It's the foundation of what it is to have preferences, what it is to have romance, what it is to you know, want to eat as opposed to uh, being a kind of paramecium that just knocks up against food sources and <laughs> consumes things indifferently. Do you think when we were evolving as humans or however we came to be, the emotions have to come from a chemical basis, right? Don't they have to be derived from some chemical that uh, triggers the brain to feel a certain way? Yeah. I mean, technically speaking, chemistry may not be all that important. Like there's a lot of talk about serotonin or sometimes dopamine. Exactly. These chemicals are like the major workhorses in the brain. And, you know, dopamine is sort of involved with everything from, from memory and attention to dreaming. I mean, it's just the idea that there's a chemical for each emotion is, is over, overly simplified. What really matters for emotions is not the particular chemical, but some very sophisticated bit of brain circuitry that, that really drives a pattern of behavior. So for depression, it might be a, a withdrawal behavior, that kind of brooding, moping behavior that makes us disengage from reality. Uh, for anxiety, it's a kind of freezing behavior where we just feel this respiratory arrest. We we feel like our heart is about to pump out of our bodies and we're paralyzed by that. 
Um, anger might be this aggression. You feel your fist clenching. And I think all of these different emotions are really better understood as, as these bodily patterns. The chemistry matters, but it's really a much more specific set of neural circuits that lead us to behave in certain ways. That's the first time. We've talked to tons of people in the psychology field and everything, and that's the first time I've ever looked at it and, and thought it's not just plain cut and dry. So what you're saying, is it possible to two people to have the same, and this is a tough question, but two people to have the same chemical reaction, right? Say you're watching a scary movie and you had them hooked up to every brain imaging thing and they had the same reaction. Is it possible that they then internalized it differently and then their outcome and the way they acted and the way their body responded would be different? Well, it's certainly possible that people could have the same inputs and different outputs. So, I mean, whereas we can think about the brain as just a system that takes all this information in and decides what to do with it. And it's even possible to show that you, you put somebody in front of a film. There's this lovely uh, neuroimaging study where people are forced to watch The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, a classic spaghetti western. <laughs> so what's going on in the brain in different people? And really, to the surprise of the neuroscientists, pretty much the same darn thing. So two different people watching the same film react in the same way. And that, you know, that's kind of cool. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're going to ultimately have the same reaction to the film. It doesn't mean they're going to, you know, do the same things after watching the film. And I think what we really need to spend more time exploring is how people have the same environment exposed to the same thing end up responding very, very differently. And the answer to that question is going to ultimately involve something going on in the brain. But we need to think of the brain as not just this kind of isolated little computer that's been somehow hardwired, but more as a very flexible system whose pattern of response is the result not of the here and now, not of the stimulus coming in, but on a whole biography, a whole culturally situated background that tells the person what they should do under different circumstances. That's incredible. I, I really I enjoy that response. And I know we're getting close to the time here, and we're doing this a little backwards. Usually I ask this question first, but especially given my own interest in psychology, I was kind of wondering if you could quickly tell us, did you always know you were fascinated by this? Have you always wondered how do people think? How am I being perceived? How are others perceiving the world? And, and how did you come to basically do exactly what you do in terms of studying the brain and people and reactions, emotions, things like that? I, I mean, I think it's a, these are questions that, that fascinate everyone. I think it's one of the really interesting things about, about people, about human beings, that not only do we have a psychology, but we can think about that psychology. So I think everyone tends to be fascinated by this. I think for me, it's, it's not clear what the path was, but I do recall from a very early stage being being an observer of human behavior. And I think, you know, a lot of people are um, fascinated by behavior. I grew up in New York, very multicultural place. So I was exposed to a lot of different forms of behavior. But then I moved to the Midwest and I lived on the West Coast and I lived in the American South for five years and I lived in Europe. And I think that path through different positions in the world was a kind of wake-up call. So if you grew up in New York, everyone is a liberal. I mean, not just a <laughs> like a real lefty liberal. Like I didn't meet a Republican until I was in college. <laughs> and you move, you know, just a few miles away. You don't need to go out to New York State. And suddenly the default is really different. And I think what that tells you uh, is that environment matters. If you look at why people vote the way they do, you can ask all kinds of questions about what sort of arguments do you have? How did you arrive at your position? The truth of the matter is demography is the bigger predictor. It's really where you grew up, what you've been exposed to. If you grew up in New York, you can just predict. If I just tell you I'm a New Yorker, you know I'm a liberal. If I tell you, you know, that I'm from rural Texas, you know I'm not. Very and true. I, Very true. <laughs> We should, we should be freaked out when we see a, an election map, like, you know, the red states and the blue states. Why should where you're located on a friggin' map have anything to do with your politics? If we did this by reason, then every individual should be able to reflect and arrive at their opinion based on whatever evidence and arguments they could come up with. And if that were the case, the map should be purple everywhere. So just, you know, just individual differences and exposure. People should end up with 
different views. But the fact that you can pretty much predict somebody's voting behavior by where they're from is a sign that culture really shapes us. So I think as a, as a kind of nomad, as somebody who ended up uh, coming from a very, very narrow cultural background, being exposed to parts of this country and parts of the world where people fought in ways that I'd never encountered um, was a major factor in me developing this, this fascination, almost an obsession with the way in which the human mind is culturally shaped. Yeah, that's a good point and, and a good place to end here. But I did want to say, I know I found you through, I read a lot of psychology articles. I read psychology today all the time. That's kind of how I found you and your work. And I know you have your website, uh, subcortex.com. And I know that after speaking with you, our listeners will be interested to check out your books and things like that. Is there anywhere else that you want to lead them or things you want to tell them about? I think you have a book coming out soon, right? I, well, the, I have a book on consciousness in the brain coming out uh, pretty soon. And the American edition of, of Beyond Human Nature is, is going to be out uh, in, the, in the weeks ahead. So, uh, yeah, those two and, and a few others uh, in development. So subcortex.com is probably the best place to go for for updates and information about about uh, upcoming lectures. So I would just advise everyone to tune in there if they're interested in these questions. Yeah, and also if they go to subcortex.com, then they can also see pictures of your brain. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's worth it in itself to check that out, right? The first time I got my brain scanned, I had this pounding pain in my chest coming from the anxiety that there wouldn't be anything there. Oh, no. What <laughs> <laughs> but... Sure enough, it's there, and you know, occasionally you need to flash those pictures just to convince others. <laughs> just to make sure. Well, Jesse, again, thank you so much for being on the show. I thoroughly enjoyed this, and um, it was great. I appreciate you kind of diving into our brains because somebody needs to do it. Again, thank you, and best of luck in the future. A real pleasure, and thanks for the absolutely fantastic podcast. I really enjoyed the previous episode. Great, Jesse. Thank you. Welcome back, guys. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Jesse. Fascinating stuff. We love having people on that talk about the brain, obviously. You know, Chris and I are both into that. We love having that type of discussion. If you guys have any thoughts and stuff and you want to hit us up on Facebook or email, go ahead, do so. Check us out at our website. Yeah, go to the website. And I'll keep this short for myself on, you know, my part here on this outro. And I just want you guys, again, go over to calebmedley.com. He's got a donation button on his page. Help him and his family out. And, you know, before we take off, I through that interview, what I thought stuck out to me the most was when Jesse talks about emotion and how it derives almost everything you do. Really think about that in your day and how how human that makes us and how real those things are, the way you react to things, the way your body reacts to things. I think emotion is something that, as Jesse states, I mean, it drives our existence. And it's a cool thought. And I think it'll also make you be more aware. Yeah. Be more aware. Reach out to to people next to you or whatever it might be. The connectivity of it all is really, really cool. So thanks for joining us today. As you guys know, we we have some awesome um, episodes planned for the future. Feel free to, you know, go to our website, go to Facebook, join the newsletter. These are all ways you can get in touch with us. And let us know who you want to hear. I recently asked on Facebook who you guys want us to interview. And I think we've set up at least three of those people we will be interviewing. So if you have authors or scientists or, you know, whatever it might be that you want to talk to, let us know. Maybe we can get them on the show. Yeah. And if you have awesome relatives and you've been holding out on us and you haven't said, hey, my uncle or my dad is so-and-so and you should talk to them. Go ahead, shoot us an email. Yep. Contact us somehow. Tweet us, whatever it may be. All right, guys. Thanks so much. We'll catch you next week.